I'm John Abramson. I'm a family physician. I practice family medicine for 25 years. Um, for the past 10 years or so, I've been looking at the drug industry and looking at the information that doctors have available to them. And what I find is that doctors who are working hard to serve their patients are deprived of adequate information because most, virtually all of the information they get about new drugs comes from the manufacturers of those drugs. And what happens is that creates two problems. One is that the efficacy of those drugs tends to be exaggerated, the risks tend to be minimized, so that doctors become enthusiastic about those new drugs, whereas older drugs that are now generic, besides being less expensive, they are also more tried and true than the new drugs, so you always want to ask your doctor if a generic drug will work. But the other issue, besides the exaggeration of safety and the minimize of harm in the new drugs, is that because most of the information that doctors have available to them comes from commercially sponsored research, the body of medical knowledge that doctors operate um, within is distorted. It's distorted towards the use of expensive new technologies and drugs instead of the common sense approaches to prevention and treatment of disease that cost virtually nothing, get crowded out because there's no commercial advantage to doing the studies and to uh, publicizing those studies. So doctors, unfortunately, have to operate with this unbalanced body of knowledge. So you always want to ask your doctor if there's a lifestyle approach, changes to your lifestyle, that you could um, integrate into the way you're approaching how you live your life that might be helpful for the particular problem that you come um, to see the doctor about or to maintain your health in general. Your doc is generally going to minimize the suggestions for those approaches because the knowledge that comes to her or him is unbalanced and because the sort of street wisdom among physicians is that patients won't make changes. But if people understand that the real efficacy, it's not just we want to save money on drugs and it's not even that we want to minimize the side effects. The real issue is that lifestyle changes are more effective than drug therapy for many of the issues that we're concerned about. If you're a medical doctor and you're watching this, the first issue is that we all, we physicians all have to understand that the evidence-based medicine that we have to practice is heavily commercially biased. And that puts us in an enormous bind because even the Cochrane Review relies on uh, evidence that is published and evidence that is voluntarily submitted by the drug companies. And when I work in litigation, often I'll use the Cochrane Review to show that doctors couldn't have known what the truth was because the Cochrane Review didn't know what the truth was. And they're trained and they have as more uh, resources and, and, and skills in getting underneath what the research shows than we individual doctors can possibly have. So Cochrane Review, yes, because they're going to do for you quickly what would take you hundreds of hours to do for yourself, but understand that that's not uh, the definitive source because the drug companies are still holding uh, not just trials back, but they're holding back the protocols for those trials and their clinical study reports. Now, there is some good news here. The Therapeutics Initiative from British Columbia, which is Google Therapeutics Initiative, and if you want to get a sense of the kind of work they do, when you get into the Therapeutics Initiative website, uh, just uh, search on primary prevention of heart disease with statins, and you'll see how they put together the data. Now, it's a rather revolutionary concept in the United States, but in Canada, academics are sponsored to do critical research to inform public health policy. And that's what the Therapeutics Initiative is in British Columbia. They're informing the province of British Columbia on uh, the best therapeutic options. So they're free, they write newsletters uh, that are published, and uh, they won't cover everything, but they cover a lot of issues. Uh, Pharmalot, um, P-H-A-R-M-A-L-O-T, is an important website because they keep current 
on what has been discovered about how the drug companies are misrepresenting information, and you can get current information about what's going on on the Pharmalot site. Uh, another site, which is good, and, and I would recommend it to your patients as well, though it may take you a little bit of extra time, is worstpills.org, Sidney Wolf's group in Washington. Um, they're good, uh, A, because they write alerts about drugs that are popular, but where safety problems are starting to emerge, and also for physicians, and this is something I use in my research, they will give a quick summary, but they'll provide you access to the primary documents that are available. So it may be FDA review documents or other documents that you probably wouldn't be able to find on your own. They've done that work, and that's a good way to get deeper into the information. As a physician, when you see patients that come in on many medicines, and you know that you're sure that you can decrease the medicines, you're not absolutely sure which ones the patient can do without or not. But the patient is, wants to be a partner with you in this project of decreasing the amount of medicine and self-care by changing diet and exercise and stress and sleep and the kinds of things that people can do for themselves uh, with some help usually. What you want to do is instead of being in the paternalistic role of saying you should be on this, off this, on this, off this, because if you take somebody off a of statin, a certain number of heart attacks are going to happen. And it may be that that statin that you took the patient off wasn't going to prevent the heart attack, but it's your heart attack if you take the patient off it. What you need to do is get out of that paternalistic role of saying, yes, you should be on this, no, you shouldn't be on this, and work with your patient as a partner. Form a partnership of information that once the information, the best information is shared in the partnership, then it's the patient's values and wishes that take over. So let me give you an example with statins. You have some, a high-risk primary prevention patient who's on statins and is not sure whether they're having side effects, maybe cognitive problems, maybe muscle weakness, could be sexual dysfunction. They're not sure if their symptoms are related to the statin, but they understand that there's some degree of controversy and want to talk to you about the statin. Now, if you take a paternalistic attitude and say, oh, no, you don't need to be on that statin, it's going to help you, you're going to own the consequences. And it's not fair to your patient, even if malpractice weren't an issue. You need to partner with your patient. Your patient needs to understand that if they're a very high-risk primary prevention patient, you need to treat 50 such patients for five years in order to prevent one cardiac event. Now that's not a yes or a no. It doesn't say you should be on a statin or you shouldn't be on a statin. But when you inform your patient of that, you then let the patient make a decision that, is, that reflects their own values and how they feel. And you also, much more important than the decision about the statin, is you want to make sure that they're living a lifestyle that's going to reduce their risk of future cardiac problems far more effectively than a statin. Now they're not mutually exclusive, but let's be sure just because we're talking about statins, that we don't get a sense that we're weighing cardiac prevention as statin or no statin. It's really <clears throat> how people live their lives that plays a far greater role in their cardiac health than whether they take a statin or not. But that said, a statin may be helpful for a relatively and unexpectedly small number of people. And that's a decision that I would see as a physician. I want to inform my patient with the best knowledge that we have um, and the Therapeutics Initiative does a wonderful job in this primary prevention. And then work with the patient to help them make a decision that they feel is right for them. And document that decision. Because your patient may say when he or she understands that there's only a one out of 50 chance that there's a benefit <clears throat> and it appears to be that there's harm, they may say either they want to trial off statin or they just want to throw the statins away. That's their decision and you want to document that you have provided them with information that reflects the best available scientific knowledge, and you've informed them that when you put their situation into a calculator or you do the calculation by hand, that they qualify for statin under the current guidelines. So that we're, the patient is deciding, based on the information that you've provided, that they are not going to follow the recommendation and the guidelines. You want to document that and you may want to talk to your malpractice carrier and see if they want your patient to actually sign something that say you said you had a full discussion of the facts, the patient understands the number needed to treat, the uh, risk of symptoms, 
and the, what the guidelines say, and you may want to have the patient actually sign that so that it documents A, your partnership, and B, that you didn't simply say, go off the statin, so if something bad happens, the family's going to come after you later. I practiced family medicine for many years. I've been on the front lines, and I understand how much harder it is to take a patient off a drug than to put a patient on a drug. And because that, the amount of drugs that people take get continually ratcheted up. And you may not have prescribed the drugs. It's even harder to take a patient off a drug that you didn't prescribe in the first place. So how, what do you do? Issue number one <clears throat> is to provide the information to the patient. And in many cases, taking those drugs, the problem is not the risk of side effects or the cost of the drugs. The problem is the opportunity cost of the patient taking the drug and feeling like they're treating their problem adequately when there are adequate approaches, effective approaches to the problem, which may well be in lifestyle changes, but the opportunity cost of taking the drug is having the patient feel that they don't have to be invested in their own health care. So I think the first issue is to reinvest the patient in their own health and work with them as a partner. And then you have to look at the medicines. Some medicines are important. Um, treating a very high blood pressure, that looks like it's an important thing to do. And uh, oftentimes you can treat that with lifestyle, uh, exercise and diet management and stress management and s proper sleep. But if the blood pressure is not coming down, you may want to have them on a blood pressure medicine until they're able to take control. And many people will be able to get their blood pressure down and some won't. And it's not a failure. Thank God we have blood pressure medicines. And if you let the blood pressure be too high for too long, it increases the risk of stroke and heart attack. Um, but this issue about sort of blood pressure with a systolic that should be under 120 and a diastolic under 80, um, that has been called back. Those guidelines were excessive. Um, but the issue is that polypharmacy is a real risk to patients. And taking the patients off is a real risk to you. And being a partner with your patient in the project is the way to go. And if your patient is not going to partner with you, it's a very dangerous process. We're in a crisis, a knowledge crisis. We've got a failure in the generation and distribution of medical knowledge. We've got market failure. And the future of medicine will only be recaptured when that market can be made to work properly. And the only way that market is going to work properly if, is if you as physicians rise up and say that we cannot work, we cannot fulfill our fiduciary obligation to our patients in this context of disordered knowledge. We cannot work as learned intermediaries because we know we don't have access to the real information. Now the European Medicines Agency is starting to make clinical study reports publicly available and we're hoping a, that those reports from European Medicines Agency can cross the ocean, and, and they probably will. And we're starting to see just a little bit of sunlight. The, the storm clouds are still gathering, but we're starting to see just a little bit of sunlight in opening up information. And I think if we can make the drug company research transparent, understanding that it's, the studies are designed to highlight their drugs and to show they're beneficial. But if we can just shine a light on that science, science tells the truth. As long as people aren't lying, as long as people aren't changing protocols and reporting secondary uh, outcome measures as primary outcome measures and playing with the intent to treat population instead of the per protocol population, these things sound really geeky, but they really make a difference. Um, but if the clinical study reports become available, we can be quite confident that we now have access to the tools we need to determine what the studies really showed. Now that's not going to solve the problem because the, the, no, the body of knowledge is still um, uh, heavily weighted towards commercially advantageous interventions and that's not going to fix the epidemiological deficits in our knowledge, but at least we'll know what the science showed. And then we need to understand as physicians that we've got to approach the lifestyle issues, that we need to engage in research, that we need to bring this to our patients, that we can't have our specialty organizations taking money from drug companies. My God, we're physicians. We're not agents of the drug companies. And so many specialty f societies do that. That's not okay. 
We need to stand up as physicians and reclaim the integrity of our position as learned, <coughs> excuse me, as learned intermediaries. And until we do that, our best intention of serving our patients won't be fulfilled. I want to say thank you, John, for creating this forum and for allowing this discussion to go on and for creating a space in which we can have honest dialogue with very intelligent people to start this process because if there's a way out of this, it's going to be because people of integrity, the public and physicians, say that we can't go forward in this context. That this, it's not apartheid, it's not slavery, but it's wrong. The people are not being served. And as long as there are places where we can have that discussion, there's hope that we can get out of this mess.